the title of this talk is called uh, Maybe We Should Slow Down. Um, uh, I'm Blaine Bublitz. Uh, you're probably saying, who even is this guy? Um, I am the co-founder of a JavaScript consulting company in Phoenix, Arizona called uh, Ice Development. Um, we do Node, uh, front-end JavaScript. Uh, we've been around for about four years now. Um, and I'm a core contributor on Gulp and Lodash. Uh, I do tons of open source. I've been doing open source since I got out of college. Um, I live and breathe this stuff. I produce a lot. Um, as you can tell by my GitHub graph uh, and the 417-ish packages, I think I probably published some since I've taken that screenshot, um, packages on NPM, uh, I put out a lot of code. Um, as producers, uh, we're supposed to move fast and break things, or so we're told. Uh, we want to live on the bleeding edge. We want to iterate quickly, uh, because those are the things that produce the best APIs, right? Uh, but is this best for our users? When we're working on projects, we need to prioritize those users over everything else. We need to empathize with them. I hope this talk is able to guide us in designing with the user in mind. However, I'm a consumer. I see myself as a consumer, not a producer. IceDev works on a lot of projects for clients and internally. And one of my roles is to find the libraries that we're going to use, uh, that we're going to depend on, and that I hope uh, don't come back to bite us. So I scrutinize over tons of little details on lots of libraries and modules. And I see a lot of stuff I don't like. Things that keep me from using those libraries. This has influenced the way I produce things by skewing my thoughts more towards uh, the pains of the user than the pains of the maintainer. As consumers, we want stability. If a library is changing every week, it's totally fun to experiment with, but it's not a stable foundation for our projects. When we look at a library, we want to quickly understand what the scope of that project is and see how it can fit into the things that we're building. We don't want to be forced to upgrade. This goes back to stability. If we continue to receive fixes and features in the version we're using, we can focus on building things instead of upgrading. I hope this talk can guide us as consumers in our interactions with maintainers to help them spend time on things that are important to us. From the very beginning of a project, we can make sure to contain the scope. By having a defined scope, it's much easier for a consumer to jump in and see how the project fits their needs. Defining and containing scope is hard. It seems to go against our natural instincts as developers. On top of that, users request a lot of features of open source projects. Users typically have tunnel vision uh, on their specific needs. And their specific needs are very narrow in the use case. Uh, to keep our scope contained, we can focus on the APIs that are widely needed and will be used by many people. I often see maintainers complaining about people posting plus ones on GitHub issues uh, to indicate interest in something. Uh, however, in Lodash, we actually welcome these, uh, f these plus ones because they tell us what features lots of people want and that we should consider adding to the library. An example of this is Lodash uh, deep property paths. Uh, Deep property paths uh, are used in this example. Um, we have a get method and a set method for accessing uh, uh, values out of path, um, uh, dot delimited. Um, the original issue for this feature was opened in 2012. It wasn't implemented until this year. Uh, I, I followed the, the string, the nest of GitHub uh, references, and there were seven or more issues with 100 or more comments on them. This shows that there's lots of interest in it. If we would have just went and implemented it back in 2012, we would have had this, a lot of baggage there. 
But we realized that that's worthwhile because so many people want it. Keeping scope focused is not only important for the user. Every feature we add has a cost. We have to become an expert in the feature that we're adding. Even if somebody sent a pull request uh, with a feature added, um, we still have to fully parse it, understand it, and figure out everything about it before we merge it. We also take on all of the maintenance responsibility for that feature. If we think back to that pull request, that same pull request, that community member that su submitted it, he's awesome, or she, is awesome. Um, and we have a new feature, and we accepted it, but they may never come back. And that means that we are responsible for the bug fixes, um, enhancements, things like that. Every feature you add will be with you for a long time. At very least, an entire release cycle. An example of this is gulp task descriptions. What gulp task descriptions are, are a, a, just a visual thing uh, for when you're listing your tasks at the command line when using gulp. And uh, people were asking for this, um, and they, they, just, they just wanted this visual feature. Some people suggested APIs, um, uh, one that I saw, uh, I went back through the issues, and one that was common was like a dot .describe method, um, and a bunch of other stuff. But that adds service area to our library. We would then have to become an expert on how this, this interaction is on this API. We, we take on that maintenance, we, and we have to support these descriptions and that API for the foreseeable future. Instead, we decided to defer this to the user. On their functions, they can just add a describe property or a description property and give it a string. This string can have uh, colors in it because it's just gonna be uh, just ANSI color escaped. Um, and it doesn't affect our API surface at all. The only piece of the code that needed to worry about this is the uh, task listing function in the command line. No API surface, nothing. If this slide was a, bud, <laughs> was a BuzzFeed article, uh, it, would, uh, it would be uh, easily contain your scope with this one neat trick. Uh, <laughs> we have the ability to defer anything that doesn't fit into our scope to user land. We should do this to the extreme. Push everything to user land. If something can be done in user land, it should go there. Eventually, if enough people are using one of these user land features, we can choose to bring it into core. And we can even use that module, that user land module, as a dependency. A great example of this is Gulp source maps. Uh, we deferred source maps to the community early on. And a great module came out of it called Gulp source maps. And as you can see, all you do is bring it in, and then you call init, and then whenever you want to write a source map, you call write. It has a lot of extra cool extra features, um, but this is the most basic usage. So we started to notice people doing this everywhere. Like every gulp, uh, eh, every gulp pipeline uh, seemed to have this in it. And when you see that boilerplate over and over and over again, you can consider bringing it into core. So that's what we did. In Gulp 4, we're bringing source maps into core behind an options parameter. And you just turn on source maps on both the source and the dest. Uh, these can also take objects that are passed directly to Gulp source maps. And it's just there for you. By deferring this to user land, we contained our scope and, and kept it as small as possible 
until we realized that there was a real need by everyone to have this. And we're actually still using Gulp source maps under the hood. We've heard of BDD and we've heard of TDD, but if we're already writing tests, we've missed this crucial part. We want to make design decisions based on users' needs. The best way to understand that is to gather feedback. We need to empathize with our users. Actually live a day in their shoes. I don't know if you saw this, but last week Facebook announced that they were going to reduce the speeds on their uh, internal uh, network uh, to 2G speeds uh, for some time every week. This will allow the Facebook employees and developers to feel the pain of the users in developing countries and make improvements based on that. If we don't actually use our libraries, we're never going to understand the problems of our users, and we won't make the best decisions. To guide our decisions, we need to gather copious amounts of information. It can be gathered from different sources. Uh, the most obvious place is GitHub, uh, your GitHub issue tracker. Um, however, the feedback that comes there is kind of skewed towards people with deeper understanding of your library already. And Stack Overflow is a great place uh, to find like actual usage um, by all skill sets. And, um, and kind of just figure out what people are running into. Um, I have found with uh, Stack Overflow that people usually put um, kind of code, just code snippets there. Um, and you, you won't see a full gulp file in a Stack Overflow post. It'll just be like a task or a single pipeline, um, which can, it, it doesn't give you the full picture. The best way to get that full picture um, is to seek out real-world usage. Um, for Gulp, uh, I've gone through a lot of open source projects that um, use it, and then I've also done some code audits uh, for companies that use Gulp, and other core members of Gulp have done that too. Um, and the real-world usage has that, has that entire context of how, how somebody's using your library. It might also contain workarounds and ways in which uh, those consumers are, are using your library in some way that you didn't think. Once we have all of that information, we can make informed decisions based on it. This way, we're going to benefit the most people with the least amount of overhead. I found this in analysis to take a lot of time. When I'm thinking about a lot of this stuff, I just let it sit in my subconscious for months upon end and kind of just let it churn and eventually something will like pop out. After we do all that analysis, we're going to start to notice emerging patterns. And I think that your subconscious is really good at noticing uh, patterns. Uh, these patterns indicate something that probably needs to change. With Gulp source maps, we noticed that um, every pipeline had it, so we figured uh, reduce that boilerplate, bring it into core. Uh, when you're noticing these patterns, pay very, very close attention to workarounds. Uh, workarounds indicate a problem, and if lots of people are doing that workaround, then something is missing from your, the core of our library. An example of this is um, series in parallel. Uh, in Gulp, uh, currently, 3.9, uh, we have task dependencies. Uh, here, you have a clean task. Uh, a, J, a JS task that depends on clean, so clean will run first, and then a CSS task that depends on JS. Uh, and then our default task runs all of them, but that dependency tree that we define, or dependencies that we define first is, are going to uh, influence the way that those run. 
This is a crazy convoluted way to run something in series. There's also a user land module called run sequence, which hooks into the internals of, of Gulp and uh, makes things run in series. So we notice this pattern, right? People want to run things in series. They also like to run things in parallel because that's what draw, uh, drew them to Gulp. Um, and like this pattern has, has shown in Grunt even uh, with like it ran everything in series by default and then somebody released a parallel module. Um, so people want to do both things. And so we decided that we were going to release a series method and a parallel method. The series method allows you to run tasks in series. So this will run, without defining those dependencies or using a run sequence, will run clean, then JS, then CSS. But what you really want to do is run clean first and then run JS and CSS in parallel because they don't interact with each other. So you can compose your gulp.series and gulp.parallel and everything will work awesomely. Most of the information that we will gather are going to be surface problems. We need to be able to reconcile those surface problems with the underlying root causes. If we take the time to discover those root causes and avoid solving just the surface really shallow problems, we're going to solve, we, we might solve multiple problems with one solution which will be less code and in turn less overhead. This API took a lot of time to come up with in Gulp, but we solve a whole bunch of root or a whole bunch of shallow problems with one root solution. Uh, and we call or I call these um, custom registries. And what a custom registry does is it lets you uh, tweak the behavior of the underlying storage for a gulp task. This example shows um, you binding every gulp task to a context. Um, people have asked for this to uh, maybe share data um, uh, or maybe find out the name of the task that's running, things like that. All you have to do is create a custom registry with a set method. Set receives a name and your task function, you do something with it, whatever you want, and then you return the thing that you changed. Um, and the, the um, default registries set returns the thing that you pass it. So um, it's, just, it's just an identity. Um, so you can call super.set with the name and then your new function and it return that and it's totally fine. And I just fixed that today. We were, oh, so this is the usage of Gulp registries, Gulp custom registries. All you do is create an instance of that registry and then pass that instance to gulp.registry. Any task registered after that is going to receive that behavior. So in this example, this of the default task is that context object. Another problem that we were able to solve is reusability. Something Gulp never considered was scaling. Uh, I had a project where um, we had over 100 repos, and every single one had the exact same Gulp file that I copy and pasted. Um, if we made a change to that, that's a nightmare, and we did. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, what custom registries are able to solve through a lifecycle method, because this is the underlying thing, is being able to register tasks in an init lifecycle method that receives the gulp instance, and you have access to all the methods. As you can see, we're doing the same registry, and then uh, in that 
or, or after we register it, we have access to clean CSS, JS, and there's no complaints. As you can see, by taking the time to come up with custom registries, we are able to solve those two problems and a whole variety of others. I have another example later that uses Gulp registries. This slide was previously titled, uh, Don't Break Your API Unnecessarily. Um, but that's a lot of words and it didn't fit. Um, we shouldn't just rename a function or two or three because we didn't like the original name we gave it. This causes unnecessary headache when users get a chance to upgrade to the, li to the new version of the library. The only way that we can alter our library and avoid breaking changes is through an addition to the API. In Lodash, we actually, actually release many versions, many minor versions between each major version. That minor, each minor version contains many new features uh, and methods on the namespace. Quite a bit of time is spent in that uh, cycle of additions before we even start working on the next major. Currently, the 3.x release is up to version 3.10, which is 10 whole releases of new features and awesomeness. Uh, and all of that happened before we started working on anything that might be considered breaking. Everything we export is a public API. Yes, even our underscored methods. This is especially important for libraries that wrap ours. A while ago, um, NPM was completely broken on a version of IOJS. It happened because uh, the graceful FS library that NPM uses uh, wraps all of the FS methods, all of the methods uh, exported by Node's FS module. IOJS, in one of their releases, decided to remove an exported but underscored property uh, method. And Graceful FS relied on that. And the whole world exploded. There were angry tweets all weekend long. The lesson that I took from that, if I export it, I maintain it. Because we can never be sure how somebody's going to use our library. ES 2015 is actually uh, giving us a, some APIs to keep private things private. And I'd like to show how uh, this can be done with uh, weak maps and symbols. <coughs> This is a fairly uh, simple example that uh, has a conferences uh, constructor and receives data and then has a find method on it. We're just, so we're just querying for that data. And a very, like, I know I'm using class, but uh, <laughs> uh, a pre-ES6 thing to do uh, would be to take that data that's coming in uh, on the constructor and uh, attaching it onto an instance property like this dot underscore data. And then you can use that later when you're doing your find. This dot data. However, users of the library might just be like, oh, I know I can access that data at underscore data and they can push things onto it, mutate it, do whatever they want with it, and they will. So what we can do is we can actually put that data into a weak map. And if you saw uh, John David's talk earlier, he talked about how he stores metadata in weak maps uh, and about how they're garbage collected and things like that. 
I'll skip over that. Uh, but just know that a, a key for a weak map can be an in, uh, the instance, the, the, the this here. Um, it can be a function. It can be a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so what we can do is in the constructor, we can use this to store a reference to our conferences, the data that we're receiving here, and it will get cleaned up whenever that, the, that instance goes away. And then in our find, we just get it out with the same this. It's not much different than what we were doing before, but end users can't access it. If they tried to re reach it, they, it's not there. So we're not, exposing, uh, we're not exposing things that we don't want to support, things that might change in the future. The other example uh, is for something that you would, uh, like a, an underscored method that you put on the prototype. And we can solve that with symbols. We can solve that with weak maps too, but I try to do it and it's really complicated. Um, so we can solve that with symbols. Uh, so this implementation, or this example is just, has a find, um, and then it has paging on it. So then we can call find next, and that increments the page uh, counter and grabs the next uh, value that matches our query. The way I implemented this was by putting a method on the prototype called underscore paging. Uh, it did the incrementing. It grabbed the next one and it returned it. Find and find next could then use paging uh, internal to them. Paging. However, a user could call that with different data and screw up our page, like our page count, because we're maintaining that internally. We can actually use symbols to finally make private functions on a prototype. The way that you access a symboled property is by having that symbol. So if that's inside of a closure or inside of our module, we're the only one that can access that. They do, however, show up in DevTools. That's a mystery to me. Um, so, <coughs> Here we can create a paging symbol, and then we can actually use that to create our paging method, and the end user won't be able to access it now. And we can still use that internally in find and find next, because we have access to that symbol there. Be careful with symbols, like I've used libraries that overuse them like crazy, and that makes things miserable. But uh, they are helpful for keeping our private things private and only exposing our public APIs. If we must make breaking changes for whatever reason, and we will, make sure they are compelling. If a breaking change isn't compelling, users aren't going to upgrade. It causes them angst for no gain. A rename method isn't a compelling reason to upgrade at all. Uh, however, we can make that upgrade enticing by batching our breaking changes. We as maintainers have the power to decide when to release breaking changes. We don't have to do it so often. We can let them pile up for a year or so without much of a problem. We have plenty to do in the meantime. I've already mentioned a whole bunch of stuff. We can add features, fix bugs, gather and analyze feedback. It takes time to come up with the right and best APIs. While we're batching those changes, we want to create a roadmap. We want to put those breaking changes in a roadmap. A roadmap is a great place to throw that big list of things we plan to break. Users can reference it uh, to see what's coming in the future, what they might need to upgrade, um, and we can actually put all of our thoughts into one place so we don't forget that obscure breaking change that we want to make down the road. Uh, 
Let me first say, Sember is good. This isn't trashing on Sember, uh, and we should all follow it the best we can. However, the Sember spec is purely forward-looking. It discusses always incrementing your version, but doesn't say anything about revisiting old versions. Once you release a version, you, can, you don't ever go back. Once we release a version with breaking changes, we're going to lose users. Uh, I asked uh, JD uh, about Lodash's uh, kind of like usage percents. And based on the dependence, we've noticed about 40 to 50% of people staying on older versions for whenever a new version comes out, new major version comes out. Around 9,400 people or dependents are using Lodash 3.x compared to 7,000 using 2.x, and 1,100 are still on 1.x. To persuade people to upgrade and build confidence in our libraries, we have to make the upgrade process as easy as possible. React is doing a great job with this, uh, not only do they have deprecation warnings whenever you use a method that they're not going to support in the future, they just released 0 0.14. Um, with breaking changes, they broke some stuff out into another module, and they shipped, with that release, a code mod that you could run on code and would update all of the, those old references to the new ones. So you don't have to go in and manually do it. You just run this tool, and it changes the code so that you have a smooth upgrade path. We tried to do this uh, when Lodash went to 3.0. Uh, we released a Lodash migrate module. And this is really cool because you could just bring in Lodash however you want and then bring in Lodash migrate afterwards. What Lodash migrate did was it wrapped all of those old methods on the version of Lodash that you're using. And any time you use something that changed, it logged it. It told you what the current usage looked like and what the 3.0 ver uh, version of that API looked like. And so you could like put this into production and gather the logs for a month and then figure out everywhere that you need to change stuff and it makes it super simple. We ran into this with Gulp 4 uh, pretty recently. Um, people were calling it forward references, so that's what I'm gonna call it. Um, basically, in Gulp 3, uh, current Gulp, uh, you can define a dependency before it's actually registered in the task system. And those dependencies are looked up when the task actually executes. So you can see here, forward references is a dependency before it's uh, actually registered. However, in Gulp 4, we plan, uh, everything's based on function composition. And we immediately look up those uh, references for performance and simplicity uh, when you request them. So what you would have to do is rearrange your gulp file to put those things first, and then access the, those, those dependencies. This was a really big problem because some people were using uh, modules that would just require a whole directory of things, and it happens alphabetically, and then everything, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can guess. Um, so we had these issues open, and some people were saying that they wanted it, but it's not something that we wanted to support in core because, again, simplicity, least amount of overhead, cover the most use cases. And, but I got to thinking, and it took quite a while, but I got to thinking, and we could solve this with custom registries. Whoa. So now all you have to do is register Undertaker forward reference and pass an instance to Gulp, and it magically works, just like you had before. 
By taking the time to develop these migration paths, we've helped to ease those pains, those migration pains of many of our users, and hopefully it gets more people to upgrade in the end. Even if we're putting in a bunch of effort to, uh, to ease migration paths through libraries, guides, things like that, we're still going to lose people. Users have finite time. Time they probably can't spend or might not be able to spend on upgrading. We can meet them where they're at by backporting features and fixes to the last major version. But this is rarely encountered in the JavaScript community. I do want to give a shout out to NPM, who are maintaining a 2.x and 3.x branch um, and porting features between the two. It's really awesome to see them doing that. We're trying to do this with the Gulp CLI, the, the thing you actually run Gulp with uh, at the command line, uh, because 3.0 or 3.x and 4.0 are incompatible. Um, but we would like people to just be able to install one version of a CLI and have it work uh, with, any, with either version. So this is rarely encountered, but why? Backporting is extremely difficult with like our standard workflow. Typically, we are working on a single master branch that's always forward facing. If we try to backport something on that branch, we end up in a nightmarish rebase. It's also extremely time consuming. Time we would rather spend moving forward, not backwards technically. Tools can help a bit with this problem. If we tag our releases with Git, which NPM does by default if you use NPM version. We can check out to that tag at some point in the future, um, which puts us into a detached head state. We can then make changes, commit on that detached head state, and we can push that tag to GitHub. Or we can tag it and push that tag to GitHub. The awesome thing about that is that the code goes with that tag. You don't have to git push origin master, it's just git push dash dash, or origin dash dash tags, and a brand new tag will be created with the code behind it. I recently did this on one of the underlying gulp libraries, and it helped fix a, a problem that we were hearing about every few months. We also need to publish that version to NPM. By default, NPM uh, tags everything you publish as latest. That would cause a lot of problems when you're backporting things. Um, but they allow you to publish uh, things with uh, tags. So you'll uh, also publish to NPM with a different tag to avoid the latest uh, being applied. Something I've noticed recently is a trend of publishing LTS versions of a library. Um, most notably, Happy uh, released an LTS version of its uh, 9.x branch when it bumped to 10, because uh, 10 was only for Node 4. The important aspect of long-term support and why I like it so much is that it's commitment to stability for a certain length of time. And the time aspect is major, because if somebody's going to support something for a year, you know you can f trust in that library for a year and allocate the right amount of time and, and when you can upgrade. I do want to note that LTS packages don't need to be published as separate modules. Uh, we can use the tags mentioned in the previous slide uh, to publish an LTS tag. Uh, which is awesome because then people can npm install uh, your library at LTS. As consumers, we want stability. 
We can't rely on libraries that aren't stable. As consumers, we want features and fixes. We don't always have the time to upgrade. and We would appreciate maintainers coming to us through backporting. As consumers, we are able to provide maintainers with feedback about our use cases so they can produce the best possible libraries. As producers, we can provide focused scope for end users to easily understand our libraries. As producers, we can provide stability by taking our time between releases and not making unnecessary breaking changes. We can seek out and receive feedback from users to guide our decision making. We can batch our breaking changes for an extended period of time to reduce how often a user might have to upgrade. And we can avoid forcing them to upgrade if they don't have the time by backporting whenever possible. And maybe, just maybe, we can slow down. Thanks, uh, Blaine. Uh, code snippets are there, and I'll publish the slides there, too.